Hi everyone, Dr. Jamie Kaufman here. I'm a minute early. Um, the, the, the prologue of this particular uh, presentation is um, I'm nervous. Um, it's been uh, 25 years since I was nervous giving a talk. And the reason is that I finally consolidated what's a paradigm shift. And paradigm shifts occur in a number of ways. Um, they can occur um, with a great discovery or something to do with, with, with drugs. Or, uh, 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 with, but, but, but often, uh, paradigm shifts occur by many years or a long period of incremental learning till there's finally an aha moment. And so, entitling a talk, Acid Reflux, You're the Doctor, um, certainly has implications. And so I'd like to talk about that. In a nutshell, acid reflux has evolved over the last 50 years. In fact, it's exploded. Everybody has reflux. By the way, they don't have GERD and heartburn, but they have respiratory reflux or LPR. Unfortunately, doctors, diagnostics and therapeutics have not. So not only is there no progress in the last 50 years, and I mean all the research is mine, um, nobody has studied it. Nobody, if you ask a gastroenterologist about respiratory reflux or LPR, uh, most of them know nothing. The go-to doctor um, knows nothing about reflux. So why should the otolaryngologist or the pulmonologist or the allergist? Indeed, the most common question I get is, which specialist shall I go to if I have, and by the way, I use the term respiratory reflux instead of LPR. And the reason is that says reflux into the larynx and pharynx, and it's hard to say laryngopharyngeal reflux. But respiratory reflux is more accurate. You can go in the nose, ears, sinuses, I mean anywhere. So uh, respiratory reflux is the new term. Um, so the questions I get is which specialist do I go see? And uh, in my opinion, um, the gastroenterologist really knows nothing about this, and they don't have any test for it. Having a Bravo test, a manometry test, or uh, uh, an impedance test, even an impedance pH test, uh, is not going to be diagnostic of reflux in the pharynx. I just know that. I had all of this equipment. I paid $23,000 for impedance system, and it just, just didn't measure up. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So then the question is, is there a doctor in my area that knows what you know? And then the big question is, you know, why doesn't my doctor know about this? So a couple of points, and they're going to seem like they're unrelated. Um, my book, Dropping Acid, has been the number one bestseller in asthma for months. So even though the medical community doesn't understand reflux, particularly respiratory reflux, um, you do. And the fact that it's not a big bestseller, but it's the bestseller in the category of asthma. Indeed, the chronic cough enigma was the best, was the number one bestseller for a long time in, in lung disease. So what that says is that there's a recognition um, among a certain segment of the population that respiratory reflux is a, is a problem. Now, um, you could say, how, 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 could it, how could it be there's been no progress? Well, in a sense, I had a monopoly. Um, I had a national practice by 1980. Um, I had a double probe pH monitoring where I had a monitor, a pH probe in the esophagus and one in the throat. Um, and when I went into practice myself, I had an ISVET chip, which is a very high quality. And, and, and these were placed with accuracy 100% of the time, and 100% of the time we got accurate information from the throat and uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux or respiratory reflux. So let's look at the situation right now. Um, impedance doesn't get it done. A Bravo test doesn't get it done. Um, and then there's a thing that the ENTs have called ResTech, um, which is, um, in my opinion, a dog with fleas. And uh, we looked at some of the data and felt that it was, it was wrong in 68%. So who would get a test that got it, got it right? Uh, whatever it is, 38%. Uh, so we don't have it. So there's, no di so, so there's no diagnostic test for reflux. The closest we actually come 
is a test that we thought was good in the 80s, which is the barium swallow esophagram. And um, it's done awake. Um, you swallow some stuff in a radiology suite, and they watch you swallow. It should be done <clears throat> upright, standing, and then supine lying down. And they can look and see um, uh, about the esophagus and the valves and so on. And it doesn't answer the question, do you have reflux, um, unless it's abnormal. But it actually looks at a lot of stuff, and uh, it doesn't require um, being put to sleep. Um, by the way, endoscopy is not how you diagnose reflux. Endoscopy is to check whether you have pathology. And if you have pathology, <clears throat> you don't need to be uh, repeatedly um, in endoscope. Hold on one second, I've dropped my, my, my notes. <clears throat> So when I when I retired when I, when I when I left medicine there was no one else who had real data for, uh, looking at the pH in the pharynx. I mean I, I did it for thousands and thousands of patients um, with precision. And so right now and then then there's this been perversion by the gastroenterologists. So if you look at reflux testing today, um, it pays very well. Um, it pays $1,868. Oh, wait a minute. The doctor fee is $119. I did it in my office. I don't get any facility fees. Oh, the facility fee is $1,749. So the gastroenterologists decided reflux was heartburn. Heartburn was reflux. They owned it. And it was all about endoscopy. The hell with, with, with respiratory reflux, Jamie Kaufman and LPR. And then uh, now, uh, no doctor uh, can afford to do this unless it's done a facility. If, you, if you're an academic medical center, maybe, but not in your office. And guess what? The same thing is true um, for transnasal esophagoscopy. The doctor fee is $84. Um, uh, the facility fee is uh, 826 And for electromyography, um, the numbers are, are pitiful. You ask why nobody's doing laryngeal electromyography. Reimbursement's $37 and facility fees 142 um, and, and EMG is the most important test I did. I made more decisions on EMG than any other test. Um, it, it tells what happened to the vagus nerve, whether the problem's active, whether it's going to heal, the prognosis. Um, it's a very useful test. And, uh, it, you know, the machine is expensive. Uh, learning curve is hard and not long. It hurts the patient to stick uh, fine needles in their neck, and it reimburses thirty-seven dollars. So nobody's doing diagnostic electromyography, and uh, nobody's doing the reflux testing. And manometry is irrelevant because most people who have uh, dysmotility or a lazy esophagus is from reflux. Uh, we've certainly seen people who have no esophageal function uh, return to flat and normal after the reflux was fixed. So uh, the barium swallow is as good as you need for looking at that. Uh, you'll see tertiary contractions or whatever. So um, the barium swallow, you can get your primary care physician to order barium swallow esophagram, and, um, and, and that's probably the way to, way to go. So the idea is I had a, I had, I had a, uh, I had a monopoly on, on the best technology. The first person to have a T&E scope, or second, in 1999, I did them every day. I was the first person at Velloprobe pH monitoring um, in the early 80s, and, and, and the technology got better and better and better. When we did manometry, we also looked at the pharynx and the upper esophageal sphincter, which no one else has done. So basically, when I was retired, this guillotine retirement, never wanted to retire, never wanted to leave New York, the state of the art collapsed. So nobody's doing electromyography, nobody's doing reflux testing, okay? And uh, no one's doing t &E. And people who did TNE, I've spoken to them, said, well, I can't afford to do it anymore. So everything went to the facility fee, and the gastroenterologists, by and large, own um, the ambulatory uh, surgery centers, uh, and, 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 and they get the facility fees. So what happened was the gastroenterologists basically hijacked reflux in the 1970s, and nothing's changed other than my work. And by the way, when the, you look at people uh, who write books, let's just say like Jonathan Aviv, it's my work. Um, there's no work that was added. It's a work on, on, on pepsin, on the activity of pepsin, on pepsin and tissue, on how to get rid of pepsin, on, on high acid and low acid food, on the Food and Drug Administration, on the prevalence, um, uh, epidemiology. All that work was done 
um, uh, in my lab. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining, but I am announcing that the state of the art right now is as good as it was 50 years ago for diagnosis and treatment of reflux. Because if the go-to doctor doesn't know anything about reflux, then what's the, well, what, what are the rest of us to do? And by the way, there's been a real trend, change in trend. Um, a gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, indigestion uh, affects um, maybe 10 to 20 percent of the population, whereas respiratory reflux, you know, too much mucus, chronic throat clearing, sensation of a lump in the throat, difficulty swallowing, cough, you name it, all the symptoms, you know, sinus problem, facial pressure, ear pr pr pressure, all these things. Uh, that is uh, most people who have reflux disease, and most of them have silent nocturnal respiratory reflux, so-called snore, silent nocturnal respiratory reflux. So this gets back to the question, okay, so if you don't have a doctor who, uh, and by the way, the ENT doctor is the closest you're going to get uh, to someone who knows anything. And they tend to be bimodal, either everyone has reflux or no one has reflux, depending upon where they trained. But I think you need to recognize that uh, the, only, the only treatment of, of reflux is, is diet and lifestyle. I'm going to give this metaphor over and over and over and over again. A very nice woman I know who's uh, thin, sophisticated. I had a fund application, the surgery, the best surgery by the best surgeon four years ago. And she consulted me long, not long ago, and she was refluxing like a bandit. And the first question I said was, what time do you eat dinner? She said, 8 o'clock. I said, what time do you go to bed? She said, 10. So in my opinion, she has a 100% chance of refluxing every night, whether she wakes up or not. Um, the acid and pepsin is in the tissue, on the tissue, and causing mischief within the tissue and with symptoms. So... The, the real question is, how do you treat reflux? And I think you have to think about it as being in stages. And so stage one is decompensated. So the more you reflux, the worse the lower valve works. It's stiff and it's swollen. Even if you have a fundoplication map, it's stiff and it's swollen. Uh, the more you reflux, esophageal function becomes impaired often. And then the upper esophageal sphincter kicks out. So when you lie down at night, What's in your stomach is in your esophagus, in your throat, and it sits there in a puddle all night long. In fact, it often is one reflux episode, which is missed by impedance. By the way, impedance makes a huge mistake. Don Castell and I argued long and hard. The, the, the GIs who use impedance say anything above pH 4 is non-acidic reflux. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, there's peptic activity uh, uh, all the way up to 6. It's not much up at 6, but... In terms of damage to tissue, it's a pH 5 or lower in the pharynx, in the airway, in the respiratory system. So we have a problem. We don't have a, a, a way to get a diagnosis and treatment. So the, the answer is that I'm old, and um, I want to get as much about what I know in the public domain. Um, I'm also old enough. I don't care who agrees with me. I know I'm going to upset an awful lot of my colleagues when I say that, and most of them went from, well, we don't do the reflux testing anymore. Now they gave that up. They gave up T&E. They gave up. So all of this is being done by GI. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the devil is GI in this case, in my opinion. So the next question comes to devices and procedures. Um, uh, every venture capital group wants to be in healthcare. There are, there are 907,000 companies in healthcare, all of whom want to make a profit. So all of these devices and all of these partial procedures don't work. The Lynx procedure, the magnets, the dog with fleas, endolinch, dog with fleas. Um, I can't remember the other ones. There, there are four or five. Dog with fleas. Partial uh, fund application wraps uh, don't work, particularly for respiratory reflux. And a full 360-degree <clears throat> fund application works but only if you have a good diet and lifestyle afterwards. And so the idea is that you have to do something to improve um, the tissue uh, that's down around the lower esophageal sphincter. So most of you are in the acute decompensated reflux stage. And <clears throat> so what that means, so this vicious cycle of going down, 
um, is not forever. It can be reversed. So you have to uh, basically stop the reflux entirely. So let's just talk about that. Uh, no alcohol. I mean, for as long as it takes for your shortness of breath to go away, your, your, your cough to go away, your laryngitis and your singer to go away. Um, so you have to stop eating uh, a minimum of five hours. Um, you can't drink alcohol. You can't eat hot dogs and hamburgers and fried food. You can't stop at chip, Chick-fil-A. Okay. Um, uh, I just let you know, I eat at five o'clock. I go to bed at midnight. I drink alkaline water all the time and I'm a gluten-free vegan. I'm actually a cheating, a cheating vegan. I eat a fair amount of fish. Uh, so I'm a pescatarian. But um, that's the healthiest diet in the world, vegan, and, and, and eating early. So you have to do this. And, and by the way, you need to be sleeping on a big incline during, we're going to call this the detox period, which I talked about last time. But as long as you have all these big things going on, like shortness of breath and, and, and daily symptoms, you know, I got a question about, you know, is, is xylitol in gum? Um, you know, make it make your reflux better and worse. It reminds me of a story, which I don't really know whether it's true or not. But uh, Lyndon Johnson, as many of you may know, was somewhat crude some of the time. And so, so someone asked him a question at, at a press conference that he thought was uh, uh, ridiculous. So he said, how can you come here and ask me, the leader of the free world, a chicken shit question like that. <laughs> so, you know, many of these questions, you know, it's like it's like the house is on fire, you know, and, and you want to know, you know, if flushing the toilet several times is going to help. Um, so I, all I'm saying to you is that um, you're going to have to, uh, and I'm telling you right now, all of the most recent information I have, I'm putting on the internet and I'm writing a book called Respiratory Reflux. Um, it's been very, very difficult for me. Um, I've been grinding day after day, month after month, and um, it's difficult. And, and when it comes out, it'll be very controversial. And most of my colleagues will say it's just bullshit. And 50 years from now, it won't be bullshit. But that leaves you stuck, okay? So you're the doctor. You're going to have to learn about reflux. You're going to learn about diet and lifestyle. You're going to have to learn about detox program. What happens at the end of a detox program? Well, 45 degrees is tough. And you put your bed back down, you start refluxing again. So maybe you need the bed that goes up and down. Little wedges isn't going to stop it. Um, we don't use proton pump inhibitors, not since 2014. Um, Famotidine, 40 milligrams before bed, works better than a PPI. And most of you have silent nocturnal respiratory reflux. So you're going to have to learn about diet and lifestyle, and you're going to have to make big changes. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. I used to say to people over and over and over, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, and uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So that's basically the story of my practice. And why don't doctors do this? It doesn't make any money to talk to people for an extended period of time about this. And even though you like videos uh, better than reading, you have to do some reading. So my blog has information. Sometimes it's a sleeper. For example, the detox diet is in the vegetarian article. Um, I think it's the smoothies list all the, uh, the pHs, acidity of all the fruits and vegetables. So there's a lot of stuff in there. And um, I'm doing the best I can uh, to get all of it in there. There's an article on Globus. I didn't present all of our data. So um, to answer the question, um, there are no doctors who know anything about reflux. Uh, therefore, there are, and there are no diagnostics and there are no therapeutics. So you're stuck taking a bunch of pills and, and, and meddling with, you know, minuscule things like what's in your chewing gum. Yeah, mint is probably worse than, uh, than non-mint gum, but even mint gum will help improve uh, a reflux after meal. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to questions and... Um, I also would ask you all to sign up for my blog. At the end of the thing, you can put your email in. We don't ever release them to anybody. And what happens is each week you just get a, a thing that an email that tells you what the topic is. And if you're interested, you open and if not, you delete the email and wait for the next one. Um, my job is to make it so um, when somebody looks up reflux, they end up on this blog. And even after my death, this will be maintained. 
And so it is my opinion, um, and so let's just say it is opinion, um, that the best information you can find is on that blog. And it's based on science, and the science hasn't changed. So um, Bridget asked a very telling question. I have burning throat with or without PPIs, which means nothing. And I've tried Gaviscon as well. Well, first of all, burning throat is often a vagus nerve symptom. Reflux makes it worse. So you got to get the reflux under control. Which, which pill you take, uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors, um, I don't recommend for a lot of reasons. There are three articles on proton pump inhibitors on my website. Uh, I like to jokingly say the, the, the side effects you want to avoid with PPIs is death. Um, there are PPIs in your, in your brain, in your kidneys, in your heart, not just in your stomach. And uh, so these, these drugs will eventually come off the market. It's my opinion that there'll be some class action lawsuits, particularly among people who develop esophageal cancer, um, having taken these things for years. So, Bridget, you may or may not, this may or may not all be reflux, and I've written literally last week an article on the three big neurogenic symptoms, neurogenic cough, throat burn, and a voice pain, a voice use pain. Um, those are the big three. Those are the big three that need treatment. So as soon as somebody says burning, I go, maybe it's neurogenic. Unfortunately, no, no one's doing laryngeal electromyography anymore. Um, after diagnosis with pneumonia, I'm tested for aspiration. Um, is there any chance that using my blue bottle to spray alkaline water could cause aspiration in my lungs? I certainly do, do hope it aspirates. It can't do any harm. All right? Aspiration from reflux is very common. Um, you see the ground glass stuff. and So you don't want to be aspirating in your lungs. It, it, it's reflux. There's no chance that the alkaline water is doing anything but helping. So if you're getting pneumonia, particularly recurrent pneumonia, uh, then you better say, uh, I have terrible respiratory reflux. I have life-threatening respiratory reflux. Um, how can low-grade dysplasia in Barrett's be reversed is a good question. Um, I've answered some questions about Barrett's. And the first thing I want to say is there's a good blog on Barrett's. Um, most of the time, uh, uh, GIs diagnose Barrett's, Barrett's. You don't have it. Uh, we looked at a large series for every uh, four patients who came to me with a diagnosis of, of Barrett's. Uh, two or three of them didn't have it. Um, there's, it doesn't matter whether you have uh, Barrett's. Barrett's doesn't cause cancer. Reflux causes cancer. And some of them do reverse. Um, but you have to be a saint. So, you know, you've had your last hot dog. Um, so the answer is, um, I have seen reversal, um, but most of the time it just stays the same or it shrinks and it doesn't cause any trouble. Janice asks a really important question. Um, when I was young, I had cavities in every tooth. I was told I had acid reflux in my mouth. And um, yeah, it's one of the worst things that can happen to an old person. As you get older, you know, I'm talking about my age, 70s, 80s. Um, the LES is generally just not as good anyway, like everything else um, isn't as good. And if you start refluxing at that point, and all of a sudden, you know, your gums are receding, and you're not going to get cavities anymore because you've got mostly crowns and other stuff in there, but um, you're going to start getting loose tooth, and you're actually going to lose all your teeth from reflux. Those people will tell you, I taste reflux in the morning. And if you don't know what it tastes like, then you're not having it. So um, tasting reflux and, and dental disease is, uh, is the worst manifestation of silent nocturnal respiratory reflux. Um, are slow motility, sleep apnea, and reflux connected? Yes. <clears throat> slow motility is very common in people with reflux. Uh, there are other diseases that cause <clears throat> uh, uh, impaired mobility, um, achalasia being number one. And I think there's a question about um, scleroderma, so the, so, and, 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 the, and, and the third one is Sjogren's syndrome. So those three things uh, can contribute to reflux big time and to impaired motility. But they're rare. I mean, it's not 1% of you. It's probably, you know, a, 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 a 5 per thousand, a half percent of you have something that's really wrong with motility. So we've seen people with complete aperistalsis, nothing moving, a dead tube, come back to flat normal when the reflux was treated. So the major cause of dysmotility is reflux. Remember, the, the more you reflux, the worse the valve, the more you reflux, the worse the esophageal function, the more you reflux, the upper valve kicks out. 
and then you have this essentially Holland Tunnel with no holes, not even an easy pass when you lie down. <clears throat> it's interesting, the next question is about scleroderma. Um, scleroderma is a very bad disease for reflux. Um, and in like people who have achalasia, you can lose motility, can have poor uh, function uh, of the LES, and I recommend um, that you buy the bed that goes up, that you sleep at 45 degrees, that you eat early, that you take Gaviscon, you chew gum after meals, and you take uh, Fomotidine, uh, 40 milligrams before bed, forever. Um, uh, and uh, there's no harm in it. And if you stay on Fomotidine for more than a year, good idea to switch it over to Cymetidine. I sw just switching the med, even though they're cousins, seems to give you a little bump. And I switch them back every year or so. So uh, scleroderma is a, a difficult disease, and it certainly um, is a, uh, uh, issues of poor prognosis for reflux. But it's treatable. It's preventable. I mean, it's to a great extent. And uh, so um, a reflux and gallbladder attacks connected. Mary Jane, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Why? Because I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of patients, and this has never come up. So uh, maybe it has come up, and there may be a relationship, but personally, I don't know what it is. So um, now come questions about treatment, and I want to say <laughs> good luck with that. Um, uh, uh, how long does it take to, it's safe to take Gaviscon? In my opinion, forever. Um, should Gaviscon advance be used to heal? An LPR flare-up, it's to help stop reflux. What Gaviscon does is not so much in the throat and so on. What it does is it rises in the, in the, in the stomach, uh, 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 creates a raft, and helps create a mechanical blockade to help blow, block up the lower esophageal sphincter. And I recommend it after dinner and before bed, uh, just to swallow. Um, so, it says Gaviscon has helped. Um, you can take it out if, if, if you're... Coming off a PPI and you're having um, rebound, take it after every meal, chew gum after every meal, read the article on gum chewing, um, more saliva, more bicarbonate, more swallowing, um, that's why, or, or hard candy, that's why we give away Ricola candies um, in Carnegie Hall. Um, so um, is there an alternative to Gaviscon? Um, I, I don't know the answer. That, that, that there, is, there are a couple of them. Um, one of them is, it was done by a friend of mine, actually my, my fellow, Peter Belaski, it's called a Reflux Gourmet. Um, and I don't know enough about it. Um, so that's research you're gonna have to do on your own. Um, my speech therapist cautioned me about using Ricola lozenges after meals where they contain menthol and drying to the throat. No, they don't, not enough to cause a problem. Uh, you can chew gum. Uh, you can chew, you take any hard candy that's not, uh, uh, I mean, you can go buy, you know, old, old fashioned Luden's cough drops. When you chew something or suck on a hard candy, you make more saliva, more bicarbonate, and you swallow a lot, pushing. Um, and by the way, you should be taking Gaviscon before exercise and chewing gum while you exercise, or a hard candy. So a hard candy is fine, it doesn't have to be Ricola. Um, now, Mary Ann wants to know about nortriptyline. Nortriptyline and amitriptyline are used for neurogenic problems, which, and a lot of you have had viral neuropathies, but, but you don't, still don't need vagus nerve treatment. You don't have primary vagal symptoms, your reflux symptoms. So the answer is what it can be used for is as an as a alternative to amitriptyline. And I don't think it's last week or maybe the week before I literally wrote this blog on, uh, on neurogenic uh, uh, conditions and their management with specific printout of how you actually take the pills, in my opinion. So you start slow um, and then you can catch up. Um, steroids inhalers are a nightmare. Um, Xanax doesn't do anything for reflux. Um, Coffee alternatives don't mean anything. You either have a problem with... I actually um, don't have reflux at this point, but I started having problems with my stomach after years of loving coffee. And um, one morning I got up and I had my coffee and I went and I threw up. So I've now switched to tea. Um, I have English breakfast tea. 
uh, first, and then I do a little bit of um, uh, uh, another alternative like Earl Grey, and then I switch to chamomile, and I drink probably four cups a day. English breakfast too. There's my caffeine. Chocolate's a big no-no. I don't know anything about carob. I think it's chocolate. But just remember, I can't know all these things. Do your homework. Uh, you know, does it contain theobromine? What's the, what, how much uh, 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 caffeine is in it, and so on? Um, <laughs> recognize trigger foods um, in pizza. Well, <laughs> they're all trigger foods. Maybe the bread is it. Um, do I recommend exercises? Only an answer. Two more questions, so I finish on time. Do you recommend exercises to strengthen the LAS? Like what? Um, and finally, um, Peg asked the question, how do you feel about naturopaths? Are they well qualified to give advice? And the answer is no. <laughs> but they are well, well, they are able to sell you things. So if a naturopath sells you things out of the office, you become an annuity. Um, you should have to go to a health food store, but they don't have any training in this any more than, than the pulmonologist. Um, and I, wanna, I do want to answer this question. Can drinking alcohol and water make your throat worse if your condition is not LPI? The answer is alcohol and water can make nothing worse than anybody, period. It's water. Okay, if you have a problem with alcohol and water, with water at pH 7, I mean, it's either psychological. There are no downsides. There are, there are millions of people who are drinking alcohol and water every day. That's what comes out of the ground where they live. So um, I, I don't, I, if, you're, if you're loving the throat, it's getting worse than. Then you get it. Now, it is true um, that people have really terrible reflux and you put the nose drops in, it'll burn. So th th there are relationships to what's happening with how much pepsin is in the tissue. But the answer is alcohol and water, in my opinion, can't make you worse. So I couldn't talk much faster. I couldn't do much more doctor bashing. But I just want to end by saying that once you get over the acute phase, um, your work isn't done. It'll take you a year to figure out which variables are most important, uh, what you can get away with and what you can't get away with. Um, it's trial and error and everybody's different. And once you're in a compensated stage, um, you may be able to cheat some of the times with some of the things and things that were an absolute no-no before uh, become okay some of the time in moderation. So anyway, I want to thank you all and good luck.